I'm Vadim from the Total Research Institute, and I'm super glad to present to you our latest work on 3D detection and 60 pulse estimation in RGB data, which we named SSD60. Uh, since most people will probably not be familiar with this field, I will give a quick explanation first. Detecting 3D CAT molds and images is a typical problem in robotics, um, augmented reality, or manufacturing. The basic scenario starts usually with a database of 3D object models, as seen here, which then need to be found in the scene image. So why is it so difficult? Although it might seem easier than category detection, like ImageNet or Pascal VOC, where classes have more variety in their appearance, the 60 pose estimation part is a difficult one. Here, detection and pose estimation are tightly coupled. We have to estimate the 3D rotation and the 3D metric translation of the objects in the scene. And we have to deal with illumination changes, occlusion, and even disparities in the appearance between CAT model and the real objects. We actually saw the slight difference while the objects were fading in. In robotics or manufacturing, poses have to be accurate for successful grasping or pick and place tasks. For AR, incorrect poses just seem awkward and appear somehow off, therefore breaking the whole experience. So before digging deeper, uh, let me summarize the key points of our work. Our method uses color only to detect objects and estimate their poses. We use purely synthetic data uh, to train our detectors. We can compete with and even outperform the state of the art that employs RGBD data in terms of detection performance. Our method can accomplish all of the above at around 10 hertz. And some code together with trained networks will be made available soon. So why not just color? The best performing methods so far have all used RGBD data. But as a human, when we look at the color image alone, we can clearly see the object. It is in plain sight. So we should be able to draw a box around the object like that. And even with one eye, monocularly speaking, we can estimate its pose rather reliably, or at least come up with a set of hypotheses. And if we can do that, a computer must be able to do that as well. We just, we need to find out how to do that exactly. And this is basically what our work SSD60 is all about. In fact, what I have just shown you is the raw output of our method. So let's begin with the first stage of our SSD60 pipeline, the 2D detection phase. So we start off in a similar fashion as the original SSD from Liu et al. We feed the image into a base network, here in Seption U4, and either branch off or produce new feature maps at certain resolutions. On each feature map, we convolve with prediction kernels that provide at each location four values that give us a refinement of the underlying anchor boxes and a C-dimensional classification vector to tell us whether we see background or an object of interest in that anchor. With our extension, each kernel predicts two additional values, namely a scoring of all possible views the objects might appear from, as well as the assumed implant rotation of that view. Let me explain. So we see here a sampling of the viewpoint space of the object. Each vertex on the sphere represents a possible viewpoint to classify. During training, we take special care whether the object has certain symmetry properties, and depending on that, we either sample from the full sphere, only from the green or red subset. Secondly, we also have a discrete set of implant rotations that we assign during training. During the detection forward pass, we now assign probabilities to all viewpoints for each detected bounding box, and the same is done with the rotations. What you see here are example training images. We take random images as background and render our objects in random poses into the image. During training, we designate all network anchors with intersection of a union above 0.5 to be positive samples, which are drawn here in green and also set the ground truth viewpoint and implant rotation to the closest discrete value that we sampled. And on to the second stage, a creation of the 60 pulse pools. Given a tight 2D bounding box in the scene, we take the object ID, the viewpoint ID, and the rotation ID that has been regressed to look up a pre-rendered view of this object in that pose at a specific distance. Furthermore, from viewpoint and implant information, we can already estimate the 3D rotation of the object. Given all the lengths of both bounding boxes, we can infer the depth, ZS, of the object in the scene. After that, we localize the projected 3D object centroid inside the scene bounding box by transferring the 2D position um, of it from the pre-rendered view. With 2D position of the centroid, the inferred depth, and the camera intrinsics, we can then build a metric 60 pulse estimate. And since sometimes the most highly scored view or in-plane rotation is not the correct one, we parse additionally the second and third highest view and rotation as well as build poses for them too. This means that each detection is now associated to a pool of 60 poses. The last stage now deals with the pose refinement and final verification to pick the best from the pool. So starting with 2D detections, we build the pools. 
given our post pool for each object, we want to decide for the one with the best fit between scene and rendering. We can therefore just simply render each hypothesis from the pool and run the computation. So if we only consider the color image as input, we compare the gradient orientations and pick the one with the high similarity. So without any post refinement, the results look like this. The poles are okay, but if we want to have well-aligned detections from manipulation or AR, we need to do better. So we therefore run multiple iterations of edge-based ICP to get something like that. <clears throat> As you can see, the poles are already way better and are suitable for AR. Note though that the upper left um, cup here is a bit disaligned due to the occluding duct tape around it. This is hard to overcome in 2D alone. Since we compare mostly to RGBD-based methods that run depth-based ICP, we also implemented an alternative refinement that uses projective 3D ICP and compute the similarity of our depth normals instead. As can be seen, the upper left cup is now well aligned since occlusion can now be nicely dealt with. So let's have a look at the results. Nonda <coughs> Note that we compare our results to state-of-the-art methods that employ RGBD data. Our first comparison I have run detection scores on the dataset of Tejani 2014, where one has to detect multiple instances of the same object in the scene. <coughs> As you can see from the table, we outperformed the state of the art by a large margin of over 13%, while being many times faster and using less information in the only color. Below we can see an example of 2G detections, 60 post pools, and, and the final output. Next, we show our results on the LIMO data set. The data set consists of sequences of heavy clutter where each image has one object of interest to detect. Here we perform better on some sequences while worse on others. We can generally say that we perform well for objects that are either large or are at the very least without ambiguity. If the objects are small or the deviation between cat model appearance and the appearance in the scene is too large, we underperform. Again, below are example output detections. We also evaluate how much influence the post pooling has on the final results. If we run no refinement, 2D refinement, or 3D refinement. If you only take the high scored viewpoint and implant rotation as hypothesis, like the left column, V equals one and R equals one, the average fixed overlap between rendering and real object is about 22%, uh, 72%, and reaches around 75% with 2D and 85% with 3D refinement. <coughs> it is evident that taking more viewpoints and rotations into the pooling increases the chance to get better final poses. Let's have a final look at the runtime of our method. By far the biggest time in our approach is the forward pass to produce the 2D bounding box predictions and viewpoint and in-plane scoring. As you can see on the right, the prediction time on a GTX 1080 and TensorFlow 1.0 is close to constant around 90 milliseconds, rather independent of how many objects the network was trained for. After that, we need to render and run projective ICP on the CPU in parallel, which takes around 8% of the time. <coughs> Finally, the verification computes the similarity between rendering and scene and takes roughly 2% of the time. So in total, we therefore usually have a runtime of around 10 hertz. Before I conclude the talk, I want to give a small peek towards what's coming. As for future work, we are investigating a new post-refinement algorithm um, to complete our fully RGB, fully learned framework. Preliminary, preliminary results show that we can now attain comparable accuracy to 3D ICP by just using 2D information alone and in real time. So this is also frame-based, there is no temporal consistency uh, implemented. Thanks for your attention, and I hope that you visit our poster tomorrow morning. We have time for questions. Please come to the microphone. I have a question for you over here. Um, sure. So, uh, this is very nice work. Thanks. I'm wondering, um, in the example that you showed, with uh, it's got a handle that rotates. Um, in the pose variation that you handle, are you able to uh, handle rotations of um, parts? Yes, so what basically we have to deal with is symmetry of objects, right? <coughs> certain objects have a certain amount of symmetry that we have to deal with. So if we have, for example, a cup, which is mostly symmetric apart from one specific part, we can either model it as a fully symmetric, with basically having one axis of rotation, um, or we can basically say that we want to classify exactly this viewpoint where the cup handle is visible, and all the other views which are identical will be treated as one single viewpoint. 
Hmm. So we take special care in our work to make sure that um, viewpoint ambiguity is taken care of like implicitly. Thank you. I had one more question uh, about occlusion. So the examples you showed didn't seem to show that. So I'm wondering how it works with occlusion from exactly. a vantage point. That's a good question. So um, in the paper, we actually show a failure case that is typical when it comes to occlusion. So if the occlusion is um, too large, which can, can then lead to like wrongly regressed 2D bounding boxes, um, which then of course in turn leads to wrong, uh, wrongly inferred Z depths, of course then the method fails because the poles are way off. So um, if we can train for it well, and we did it only like, um, we didn't try too much, but if you, if you train for occlusion, um, you can of course handle it up to a certain amount because at some point you only have color as information given and then you always run into certain problems. 